humanity has long looked to the stars for answers, answers to many questions. From the straightforward, when is the next equinox, to the more profound, what is our place in the universe? Astronomy is the oldest of all the sciences, a bridge that connects many societies, many that never knew the existence of others, yet it continues strong to this day. As technology improves, so does our understanding of the cosmos. But are we any closer to figuring out our place in it? Perhaps a reasonable question to start with might be, are we alone in the universe? Join us as we probe this question from the perspective of our small place in the universe, as we journey from burning hellscapes to freezing landscapes housed within our own cosmic backyard, we will look at what scientific discoveries indicate about the possibility that we are not alone in this universe. Welcome everyone to this, a special episode on my channel where along with my lovely enlisted help, we're not only going to look for environments conducive to life in this solar system, but possible signs of life itself. Now, before we go exploring, we must first take a look at, well, what we're looking for. Science is forever widening our scope of what might count as life. However, that being said, there are still three basic criteria that can be considered necessary. The first is a suitable medium. For this, liquid water was long thought necessary to fulfill this role. However, it turns out there might be many other possible chemical mixes that will do the job just fine. Basically, as long as it isn't solid, we might find life there. The second, unsurprisingly, is appropriate chemicals. Whilst it's hard to narrow down a list, even for life as we know it on Earth, there are certain elements that are generally considered appropriate for making a suitable habitat, such as carbon, which provides a brilliant backbone for building organic structures, and it's fairly abundant in the solar system. Hydrogen, which is also very abundant. Sulfur and oxygen could also be needed. And lastly, and maybe not so intuitive, is phosphorus. Whilst it's possible to have life forms without it, say maybe something based on arsenic of all things, all life on Earth needs it. For a start, it builds the backbone for both DNA and ATP, which most life needs. Thirdly, we need joules, or whatever your preferred units of measurement for energy are, because all life needs fuel. On Earth, most of that comes from the sun, but importantly, not all of it. Our energy source, for our aliens, must be sufficient to keep our medium a liquid and to provide a chemical mechanism that allows them to breathe and eat. So, with all that out of the way, let's go blasting off. Our first stop is Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, named after the Roman god who, fittingly, amongst many other things, was a guide of souls to the underworld. The planet experiences burning temperatures of around 430 degrees Celsius, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, on the side facing the Sun, and icy, frigid temperatures of negative 170 degrees Celsius, negative 280 Fahrenheit, on the dark side. Even with an orbit of 90 days, it still does rotate slowly in comparison with the sun. If you were on the planet, you would experience the sun rising and setting several times in a row each time a day began or ended. As beautiful as this may be, it also means nowhere is safe. Or maybe not. It was long thought that after the planet's formation, it began to slowly cool into the inactive sphere it is today, with most of its surface features being caused by meteorites most of which probably impacted the planet in the early solar system when there was a lot more debris floating around that could smack into a planet. However, the recent messenger probe... Wait, seriously? That's not how you acronym, what are you doing astronomy? Ah, oh well, it's not like I'm going to take this opportunity to explain some of the other weird and wacky acronyms out there in science, like HERP, 
or derp or inadequate or big ass or wise ass or proton enhanced nuclear induction spectroscopy. Wait, what was I doing again? The messenger probe's four year orbit of Mercury gave us a much better picture of the planet's surface. This detailed look showed some surprising features on chaotic terrain features that didn't form at roughly the same time or from just meteor impacts. One such example is the Caloris Basin, the solar system's largest impact crater. A paper published last year suggested that many geological features, closely resembling those that we find on Mars, may have been formed relatively recently from tectonic activity and volatile rich layer collapse or devolatilization. The researchers explain that Mercury experienced tectonic disturbances such as lava flows relatively recently and, quite surprisingly, that the planet may still be tectonically active, which for its size is quite a big thing. And importantly for our search for life was the devolatilization, which is basically the buildup of chemicals over time that then evaporate or sublimate off the planet's surface. This leaves behind water-like erosion marks and tells us that there is at least some chemical movement on the planet's surface. Which begs two important questions. What are these chemicals and where are they? Well, answers can be found at the poles. Here impact craters provide enough shade so that even as the planet rotates, the inner portions never see the light of day and are never blasted away. As chemicals are evaporated elsewhere on the planet, some of them find their way to the protection of these shaded areas, allowing for chemical buildup over time. So now we have a mechanism. And importantly, spectroscopic analysis suggests that these are mainly made up of water ice and sulfur containing compounds. And although we will not find out more until we actually send a lander there to figure out exactly what the chemicals are made of, it still shows that even on such an intense surface like Mercury, we can still find some of the ingredients for life. Our journey continues as we begin to blast further away from the sun, but the temperature's not dropping just yet as we arrive at our next contender for life. Venus, the goddess of love and Earth's closest neighbor, is literally too hot to handle. With surface temperatures above 470 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to melt lead, it already seems an unlikely place to find life. And to make it even more inhospitable, surface pressure is a hundred times that of Earth. It is equivalent of being one kilometer below the surface of the ocean. For comparison, a nuclear submarine, Los Angeles class, has a safe test depth of only 450 meters, which is less than half. Even at its unsafe maximum depth, it would not survive the surface pressure alone on Venus. And this is not to mention that the Venusian atmosphere is mainly made of acid. Venus was the first planet to have a probe land on its surface and take photos, thanks to the Cold War era Soviet Venera project. Venera 9 was the first to actually have a lander successfully touch down on the planet's surface. In the 53 minutes before contact was lost, it was able to take a 180 degree photo of the surface, which was the first of its kind. It was though meant to be a 360 degree photo, but one of the lens caps failed to come off. However, there was Venera 10 just a few days later to solve the problem. Kind of, because it had the same problem and one of the lens caps failed to come off, so they got two 180 degree photos. Also with the Venera missions comes one of my favourite examples of Murphy's Law, and that occurred with Venera 14. The lander here actually lasted for two hours and was fitted with a lot more equipment to give us a better understanding of what was going on. Included in this equipment was a solid compression device, which is basically a needle on a hammer. It swings out, smacks into the surface, and based on the results it gives us a very basic idea of what the planet's surface is made of. However, this time the device worked perfectly but only gave us an idea of what the lens cap was made of. For you see, the lens cap this time actually came off 
and landed in the exact place that the hammer did too. So, well, at least the lens cap worked, I guess. However, these probes did give us an insight into what the atmosphere was made up of, or at least what the main components were. And number one was sulfuric acid, which, apart from melting things, is also really good at trapping heat and is responsible for the high temperatures that we see. Alongside this, you also find some hydrochloric acid, which is what you find in stomach acid, and some halogens, and the lovely HF or hydrofluoric acid which if it gets onto you, it goes through your skin and then starts eating you slowly from the inside out by dissolving your bones. Lovely. Given that the conditions on Venus would make the worst levels of Dante's Inferno look like a pleasant walk in the park, what was all the hype surrounding a paper published in September of 2020 where scientists claimed to have found possible signs of life on Venus? Well, to understand what's going on here, we first must look at how we're detecting chemicals on distant planets. Spectroscopy, which is my favorite area. Yay, I actually do this for a living. These are techniques used to identify and study chemicals by looking at absorption and emission of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Every element and every chemical has a particular color, even if we can't see it with the naked eye. For the colours we can see, they arise mainly from the different electronic environments that are created by unique combinations of the positive nuclei and the negative electrons that surround them. Moving these electrons around and exciting them takes very specific amounts of energy. And different wavelengths of light also have different associated energies given by the simple but powerful e equals HF. What this means is that if we match the energy of a photon of light up with the energy needed to move one of these electrons up, well, then we get absorption and that light disappears. And this also works in reverse. If I pump a lot of energy in, say in the form of heat, then I can get that back out as very specific wavelengths of light as emission. Now, when you look at the absorption and the emission of an atom or of a molecule, then you can use that to identify what it is, much like you'd use a fingerprint to identify a person. Now, whilst all this occurs with shorter, higher energies, mainly visible and ultraviolet ones, this also can work with longer wavelengths if we do other things to the molecule. Say, if I make the molecule bend and stretch and twist, that takes particular energy, it's normally in the infrared region. And if we keep going further out to lower wavelengths, you can get absorption at very specific wavelengths based on rotation as well, which is how microwaves work by basically making water molecules in your food spin around and providing energy that way. So what color caught the attention of scientists? Well, it was a absorption band at 1.123 millimeters that was noted by the JCMT and ALMA telescopes. This particular wavelength is associated with a rotational transition of phosphine or pH3. This was big news because there is no known abiotic or non-life based method for producing the concentrations that were measured. However, there are microbes on earth that produce small quantities of pH3 in low oxygen environments. So the scientists concluded it might be a possible sign of life on the planet. And it turns out this is not our first indicator of possible life. A paper published in 2018 explained that as of yet unidentified spectral features in the ultraviolet region, mainly between 330 and 500 nanometers, could be possible biosignatures as well. And reanalysis of the 1978 Venus Pioneer multiprobe also showed evidence of multiple chemicals, including, once again, phosphine. But how? If Venus is so hostile, where's life eking out an existence? Well, whilst the surface is definitely hellish, the upper atmosphere is a much nicer 60 degrees and about one atmosphere of pressure. Which, whilst that's a bit warm by our standards, plenty of life on Earth can survive in these conditions. So it's at least hypothesized that if there is life on the planet, it might be surviving in some kind of life cycle in the upper atmosphere. So can we end the program here and say we've found alien life? Oh, if only it was that easy. 
Unfortunately, within a month of the paper being published, a reanalysis of the data suggested that the concentration of pH 3 was only a quarter of what was originally reported. And by late October, another paper suggested that there was an error with how the background was accounted for, meaning that the concentration couldn't be higher than 1 20th of what was originally reported. Also, a further study suggested that they weren't even looking at pH 3, but it was an absorption band of the rotten egg gas sulfur dioxide. However, this find has already been disputed and no conclusion can be given. It's quite possible that they're even looking at different parts of the atmosphere. However, a probably bigger nail in the coffin for life on Venus would be the concentration of water, or lack thereof. Unfortunately, sulfuric acid acts as a brilliant drying agent, pulling water away from any available life, meaning that it's probably too dry in the upper atmosphere or, well, anywhere on the planet to support life. As of yet, no conclusion can be reached about the possibility of life on Venus, let alone even the concentration of pH 3 on the planet. What can be said is that it's very, very difficult. Remember, we're trying to look at an incredibly thin region around the edge of the planet from millions of kilometres away. And to top this all off, the original paper only published a concentration of 20 parts per billion. Like any good scientific inquiry, more conclusive evidence needs to be collected before we can say for sure that there is phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And in this vein, we are actually on track to get our answers. NASA currently has plans to send two probes to Venus, Veritas and Da Vinci Plus, which will hopefully answer this question and further our search for extraterrestrial life. And with that, we now move on to another location in the solar system that once had a very similar debate about a possible chemical signature of life. The god of war and likely Earth's long-lost cousin, in the distant past, both Mars and Venus probably looked a lot like Earth. Venus before its runaway greenhouse gas effect took place, and Mars before the lack of a magnetic field and the smaller gravitational pull allowed most of its atmosphere to be blasted off into space. Whilst the red planet now is home to only a thin, cold atmosphere, its past resemblance to Earth makes it a useful study about our cosmic history. Other than Earth, Mars is by far the most studied planet in the solar system. The surface of the red planet has even been mapped to a higher resolution than the bottom of most of Earth's oceans. Even if we don't find life here, it may allow us to look upon an environment that once resembled a prebiotic Earth. If you took a trip there now, you would see the effects of a range of different mechanisms that once shaped the wondrous planet. From wind erosion and meteor impacts, to chemical reactions and volcanic activity, the planet certainly has had an interesting past. The largest volcano on Mars, Mount Olympus Mons, is nearly three times the height of Mount Everest, at 25 kilometers tall. However, this once lively planet seems to be a much quieter remnant of its past. That doesn't mean the God of War is quite finished yet. Possible evidence of flowing water has been found on or near the surface of Mars, with many suspecting that it's a brine or concentrated salt solution. However, there are others in the scientific community that claim that this evidence could be explained by the movement of things like dry sand, without any water being present. However, this also doesn't rule out the possibility of water existing underground in a liquid form. And in fact, there are geysers that form seasonally at the planet's poles, spitting out mainly CO2 and possibly water. And they also show a really weird growth rate for geology. However, the geology on Mars is already pretty weird, so that's not necessarily a surprise or evidence for life. Not only do we have evidence for a possible liquid medium on the planet, we also have methane. Why is that so exciting? Well, it should have broken down long ago in the Martian atmosphere, and on Earth it's produced by microbes known as methanogens, so it's a possible sign of life on the red planet. Now, whilst the debate about the existence of CH4 on Mars was quite hot, 
it has been settled by the Curiosity rover that not only confirmed its presence, but also showed that it was being produced seasonally, which at the very least might be indication of possible current or past life that once inhabited the Martian landscape. Unfortunately, the presence of methane can be explained by completely geological processes and studies that look at the ratio of hydrogen to methane suggest that life isn't the likely answer either. And to top all this off, even if it was the result of life, it's probably too far underground for any rover to ever reach, so it's going to be a long time before we find answers. But it does suggest that the planet is not nearly as inactive as we once thought, so there is a lot more we have yet to find out about the planet. And as I speak, Perseverance is currently testing Martian samples, so there's a good chance by the time I release this video, it's already going to be a little bit out of date, but hey, that's how science goes. Oh, and we're not done with our little rust bucket yet. We've got more. We actually have fossils from Mars! Well, maybe. Very, very big maybe. And they're technically ichno or trace fossils, where ichno fossils are basically the remains of any organism where the organism itself was not preserved. Burrows, feeding marks and trackways are all very common examples for Earth. But we do have possible ichno fossils from Mars that we've been able to study in laboratories here on Earth. You know, Ray, I don't like the look of these peculiar formations either. Though I'm sure they're just rot. I've been watching them very carefully. There's no sign of movement. I think we'd better take a sample back to Earth. In the past, Mars has been hit by many meteorites and other debris from space. These impacts have broken pieces of the planet off and sent them hurling into the void of space. And luckily for us, some of those pieces have found their way to Earth, with a few key examples being found in Antarctica. To pick a few examples, let's start with Yamato 000593, where evidence for water movement and carbonaceous matter was found that is comparable to bioerosion of all things. Also, to go back to the earlier quote, that was in regard to meteorite ALH 84001, where high concentrations of hydrocarbons, specifically polyaromatic hydrocarbons, were found. PAHs are basically organic molecules with lots of double bonds that look something like this, and they're a possible byproduct of life. However, once again, these and other ichnofossils can be explained by abiotic, chemical, and physical processes, no life necessary. And in fact, the ones we've looked at show features that are 10 times smaller than the smallest known for bacteria on Earth. So, as interesting as these are, we must continue our look for life elsewhere. So, with that, let's move on. We now venture further out into the solar system. Moving away from the rocky planets, we head toward Jupiter and away from the warming embrace of the Sun. However, along the way, we spot something lurking in the asteroid belt. At approximately 2.8 AU, or 2.8 times further out than Earth, the dwarf planet Ceres looms ever closer. Although it is 14 times smaller in size than Pluto, this little rocky object makes up 25% of the entire mass of the asteroid belt. With a nine-hour day taking 2.6 years to orbit the Sun, it wasn't a likely contender for life in this solar system. So why are we here? Ceres is named after the Roman goddess of corn and harvest, which incidentally is where we get the name Cereal from. This small body is only 476 kilometers wide and was first discovered in 1801 where it was originally thought to be a planet, but then it was downgraded to asteroid. However, in 2006, it was upgraded to its current status of dwarf planet. It was long thought that any heat had long since dissipated from the little dwarf planet, making the presence of liquid water all but impossible. But 
once again, the solar system proves to be a much more interesting place. In 2018, data from the Dawn probe revealed a large brine reservoir some 40 to 65 kilometers below the surface, spanning some several hundred kilometers. The reservoir is believed to have been formed by a meteorite impact some 20 million years ago. The heat of the impact melted a slushy area just beneath the dwarf planet's surface. The heat of the impact also created a number of cracks that reach down to the long-lived reservoir and allows for solution to still rise to the planet's surface. Whilst we're still missing a lot of ingredients for life, it does show that liquid mediums are far more common in the solar system than might be first thought. So with that in mind, let's go looking for more. And as we lift off once more, it's time for an intermission. We still have so many places to visit, from the violent volcanic Io to the seas of Titan to the cold blue Pluto. However, all this must wait for part two. Unless it's already out and you click the button over here. However, regardless of that, the best is yet to come and we have so many more places to go looking for alien life. Please, stay tuned. <laughs>